Hi, I'm Ted Price, founder and CEO of Insomniac Games. And on behalf of the AIAS Game Makers Notebook, I had the pleasure of talking with Nathan Vella, who is the founder and CEO of Cappy Games. Nathan and I talked about a variety of subjects, and some of the things I think you're going to love are first his journey into games. Nathan talks about his film background and how it took him into the game development scene. We also discuss Cappy's unique approach to developing IP, and if you played any of their games, you're going to be really interested in how they come up with their ideas. And we also discuss the burgeoning indie scene, which continues to grow and evolve. Nathan's involved in Indie Fund, which is a group that helps to give feedback to and sometimes fund fledgling developers. And if you're interested in starting your own game company or in the indie scene in general, you're going to definitely want to hear what Nathan has to say. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Nathan, it is a real pleasure to have you here because the games you make are so unique and I know that you have a huge following out there. We, I hope so. I, I, I feel like we do, but it's kind of hard to tell these days. Social media makes uh, everything feel smaller or bigger at the same time. But yeah, we're, we're really happy that people have followed us through the kind of crazy thread of different genres and different aesthetics and We've never really kind of come back to the same game twice. So having fans that have stuck around and kind of followed the studio and our weird takes on different genres has been probably the most gratifying thing. Like when we started the studio, we were uh, we never set out and said, well, we're just going to do different genres every time. Uh, but it kind of happened that way. Um, and a lot of people ask me about like, oh, does it suck kind of like having to restart from scratch every time? But as the years have gone on, people have started to kind of stick around and trust us. Uh, and that's, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know if I <laughs> would do that, but I'm super appreciative to the people who have kind of, they they just kind of wait and see what weird stuff we cook up next. And Well, what I think is fantastic is that what what you make ends up being surprising and unexpected. I mean, when I played Swords and Sorcery, right, that was a game that, I had actually, I think, unconsciously been looking forward to for a long time because it took me back to when I was 12 years old playing games on the Apple II with that retro feel and that, but that feeling that there was this adventure hidden beyond the pixels that mm-hmm. was so unique. And it really was playing your game. I, it was, it had a flavor that I didn't see in any other games at the time. And that, that was kind of, I think, a big turning point for us. I mean, that was, we put that out in 2011. And we started in 2005. So that was kind of like, yeah, we're almost 12 years old. So that was like the halfway point of the studio. Um, and we had gone through a whole process to, to even get to a point where we could make a game like Sorcery. Um, but it was also the start f- for us of like wanting to collaborate with people outside of games a little more. Um, but it was also when we started to kind of realize that like, well, first of all, this is what we started the studio to do. Mm-hmm. All the stuff that had happened before was just building towards games like Clash of Heroes and, and Sword and Sorcery, which both came out the same year. Um, and when we got a chance to work on I mean, Sorcery was supposed to be a 10-month project. You know, it's a it was a cell phone game. It was a mobile game. You know, you don't need that long to make them. This is what was going through our head. And we got to 10 months, and it was, like, not even half done. So we you know, took more time like we do on almost everything, but it was, you know, it was a super important game for us from the creative perspective as in like teaming up with Super Brothers to make kind of something that we thought was special. Um, But also it was one of the first games where kind of from the ground up, we said like, we're actually going to purposefully do something really different Mm -hmm. with Clash of Heroes or with Critter Crunch or with our past games. We knew they were different, but that was kind of the, the the game mechanic had come out of our creative director's head. And we never really sat down and said, let's from scratch think about doing something that is kind of strange and off. Um, Sorcery was really that like first kind of like, 
wouldn't it be cool if we just did something that was really actually different from the start? Um, and it, I mean, I remember sitting there thinking that it was like, I was really happy with it when it was done. I was really proud of it. And I was really um, proud of the fact that we like did what it took to actually finish it the way we wanted to finish it. Uh, but I had no idea how impactful it was going to be. I had no idea that it was going to reach the people that it reached. And it really, I mean, it was kind of the game that put us on the map in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, my Magic Clash of Heroes was a really, I think for us, a really important game, but it didn't find the same type of audience. Yeah, I found it. I, was, I mean, I'm still surprised at how well Clash of Heroes did, but Sorcery was a whole other level. And that really turned the studio around. I mean, we were having a pretty tough year that year, so it came at the best possible time. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was that game. And I mean, still to this day, that's, it's almost six years old. Uh, and we still get a lot of a lot of cred for it and it's helped us in you know pitch people crazy ideas and get people on board with what we want to do it's helped us uh you know really appreciate how important that kind of aesthetics and and making something that can stand out is mm -hmm. and i think that's been driving us kind of ever since well it seemed like you upped the crazy a lot for super time force yeah that was that was a like where where sorcery was us sitting down and saying like let's do something like let's try to find something different to make super time force was kind of a totally different thread where three of our longtime employees Ken Mike and Vic uh, I mean they had been with us since the studio had started almost they made a game in a game jam and we played it and loved it thought it was hilarious and thought it was a great idea it was you know after three days there was something there so it became a Friday project. Um, and they were working on it on Fridays and getting like a lot done in, in eight hours. Um, and at a certain point it kind of turned into a, like, well, obviously this is, you know, a cool thing. Like we sat down and talked to, to Kenneth and Mike and Vic and just kind of said like, what do you guys want to do with it? And the next thing we knew it was no longer, we had kind of pushed the game that they were working on off to the side and it became a full project and we thought it would, you know, again, thought it would be a, a year, year and a half and it ended up being a little longer than that, but uh, it was, it was, a. Uh, it's strange to have games that start in such different ways. And that's, I think that's one of the, to me, the most interesting things about, uh, being part of running an independent studio is that I'm never, I never know what the next project's going to be. And I never know how it's <laughs> going to come together. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a process that they follow past a certain point, but where does that spark that, that nugget of, of creative joy come from? It could be a game jam. It could be just a you know a random meeting, which is how Sword and Sorcery started. We just randomly met a really cool person whose art we knew. Um, Chris had the idea for the battle system in Clash of Heroes while playing Puzzle Quest in the bath. I mean, <laughs> they all, it comes from anywhere, and then okay. somehow coalesces into two to seven years of your life, and then becomes a, a product that people take a lot of entertainment from. It's it's very strange to me, and it. I never really, and then we're, I mean, when we talk about like, how do we foster the next Cappy games internally, we all just kind of sit there and shrug. Like mm. we're, we don't, there's no process for us. We can't really figure out how to like, how do we, how do we like, you know, put a document together that'll help and that just is not going to work for us. Somebody's just going to pitch something crazy and we're going to get behind it. Well, it sounds like you have at least something that helps generate ideas. You, you mentioned Friday something or other? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have we do internal game jams. We do external game jams. We have in the past had a whole bunch of different Friday projects that have become either nothing or turned into something. We have one that got kind of parked for a little bit, but we'll be picking back up soon that I'm super excited about. It's fun to, to just kind of have something else. I think that's like a lot of smaller studios are one project studios, and I, and I think that's great if it works for them. And, and I've take, personally taken a, a lot of like strength and I actually would attribute a, a fair amount of our kind of like creative success to the fact that we've done a whole bunch of different games and we are always doing two or three games at once at the studio. It just kind of like creates some kind of strange creative energy that pushes everybody. And even if, even though the two teams are almost entirely or are entirely separate and there isn't any real cross pollination, People can look over the shoulder and see a weird cartoon game getting made at the same time that they're making this somber dungeon crawler. And it just kind of, I think, percolates some 
interesting perspective, or at least it just keeps people interested. At least it's just something different to look at when you've been looking at the same thing. And I think that's, a, I, I keep kind of nudging some of my friends who are in the kind of like still a single project, but could do two projects. And I'm just kind of like, do you give it a shot? It's a lot of fun. It's a lot more work, but it's a lot of fun. Who, who takes most of the stress for a multi project studio? Gosh, it's, I, th I think in the past it was definitely Chris, our creative director. He, he wanted to, and often kind of, uh, like felt a real need to be involved in both projects at a, at a time. And I think it took a, uh, I think that's really, really hard to do. Yeah. Uh, I think really what ends up happening is you just take somebody's energy and stretch it out as far as it can go. Um, for me, I think it's, I mean, I, I love that part of it because I'm not in, I'm not actually kind of, none of the ideas are mine specifically. None of the direction is mine specifically, but it's an opportunity for me to try to like, to work with everybody to be instead of just picking a team and sticking with 10 or 12 people, I'm, I get to work with all the entire studio, which I get the best end of it. And I think, uh, like our audio director definitely, uh, gets stretched pretty thin with that too. But, um, I think overall for it's, it's kind of the, the like director level people that tend to get spread across multiple projects, right. but everybody else gets to kind of stick in. Um, do you think there's a solution for that? Yeah, I, I definitely do. I just think that we have done a terrible job at implementing those solutions. I mean, for us, well, like we just kind of, we've brought people up in the studio that can run projects themselves and don't require as much of the kind of director level people's time, yeah. which I think that delegation and what really actually that means is that level of trust and, and comfort in those people to run projects. Uh, that is a huge plus like that. That's the solution to me is that as certain people in our studio take more leadership roles for themselves, just kind of grab a project for themselves and then we can just let go. Yeah. Um, and a huge part of that is that when, at least for me, like when, when we started the studio, we started the studio to make games that we wanted to make. Um, and that I think really drives your desire to kind of just grab onto the project, hold it as tightly as you can almost like overmanage it almost like you know it's it's yours and you don't want to let go and no matter what happens it's yours um that that doesn't work very well and i think as you grow up as a creator and grow up as a like as game developers you learn the more that you delegate the more that you trust the people around you the more freedom people have to bring their own flavor to projects the the less stressful it is for the people who kind of have the most stressful jobs and the games get like 10 times better just by proxy so why do you think that's challenging for people to learn because if nobody wants to let go of their own ideas right, right. Every, everybody wants they want they want to control the outcome that's kind of why I, well i don't want to put words in everybody's mouth but a huge portion of people i think who make games make games because they want to say something do something draw something show something uh -huh. um, they have an idea that they want to get out and if somebody tells you like let's do your idea or you're in charge of this idea uh I think it's just natural for people to want to have some kind of tight grip on it. Um, I also think we start, typically we all start young. We yeah. all start making games when we don't understand the value of camaraderie and, and, and the value of the people around you. And as time goes on, um, I, the way that I always explain it is like when, when we started, we, all we cared about was making a great project. And we thought that that was the path. Just brute force your way through to make a great game. Whatever it takes, we're all together here to make a great game. And I think over time, what we've really realized is like the, the game just kind of is a byproduct of how well people work together, how happy people are, how much control and ownership they can take over the projects, how much trust they're given by the people around them. And I mean, we st we're still terrible at that. We're still learning how to trust and even though we've been even though we have a team that's been together for i mean 17 of us have been together for like 10 years nine years so but it's it's a process right i, I think that's it's very easy to say this is the right thing to do it's a whole different thing to actually like show up at a studio and and implement those things and uh it's it, it it's not an overnight solution but I, at least i'm from my perspective and i can't speak for the entire team but like that's happening it's just taking kind of like it's it's a thing that as we add new people, they need to become part of that process. And uh, yeah, 
it's it's a hard. <laughs> well, so speaking of challenging aspects of production, when you've delegated creative authority to others, what do you do when you see things going off the rails? Oh, you just talk to them right away. So it's just a face to face communication saying just being honest with people. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things I enjoy most about my job is just sitting in a meeting and asking a question. I don't know the answer to the question. I don't want to even know the answer to the question. That's not my job and that's not what I enjoy about making games. But I, I really enjoy being the person who can kind of, who's not, I'm not in the shit. I'm not kind of, the game's not right in front of my face. I have some perspective because it's not literally mine. And so I can ask a couple of questions or I can try to, you know, guide people in a direction that will I think will be more productive or more healthy or more, make a better game. Yeah. Um, most of the time those questions come from the team themselves. I don't have to ask them, but every once in a while it's, it's clear that something isn't working or something is working, but there's, you know, some kind of haze around it. And usually it's just a question or two that to kind of help people kind of see, to, to take the kind of like immediacy of the games, like smushed up against their face and they're trying to see around it, but they can't because there's certification on Monday. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I really, I, I think asking those questions and kind of like providing that context and that perspective is, is a, the easiest way to solve those kind of like, everything's going pear-shaped, what the hell do we do? Well, in those situations, how do you make it, people feel safe about speaking up and, and, and contributing what can often be harsh criticism? Yeah, it's a really, really good. I mean, I think we're a very self-critical studio. Um, I think we're a very critical in general studio and, and quite often that does go wrong, right? It's very hard to walk that knife's edge, I think. Yeah. Um, I think quite often, especially on projects that take longer, or that have gone on for a while, that missed a deadline, that whatever, like the, the tensions kind of ratchet up and then those that critical feedback, the, the knife's edge even gets thinner and thinner. Um, I mean, we, we have the obscene luxury of people who have worked together for a really long time. So when people do cross the line and it does get a little bit testy, usually cooler heads prevail and you can kind of just say, oh, yeah, I know it's, it's the wrong thing for the wrong day. And now we're, we can kind of come back to it later and have a much more productive conversation. But I mean, again, it's I think if it, if it's new people coming to the studio, it's kind of just like part of the process is like, oh, hey, by the way, like we're just going to tell you that this stuff doesn't look that good and that we should do X, Y, and Z to fix it. I hope that's cool. It's not a, like, it's not a big deal. It's kind of the way that it should be. And I, I think for, for artists specifically, they're really easy because they come up through criticism. They come mm -hmm. up through, or hopefully they do. Um, and, and quite often younger artists, uh, thrive under even relatively harsh criticism uh, because they know it's going to help them get better. It's I find it a lot different with with programmers and with people in technical roles because the the language is entirely different and the kind of the, the way that you grow up is entirely different. You, um, but I also find that it's it's just like it's a, it's different words tend to mean a, a lot more to different people. Like we have this thing in the studio where we try so hard, like really hard to never say like, can you just to, to specifically to programmers because they always get that like, oh, we already have that tech. Can you just like maybe make it just do this one thing? But the just is like a, it's like a knife in the, <laughs> just being twisted in the arm because like some non-technical people make a lot of assumptions about technical solutions. And, yeah. and it's the same, I mean, technical people do that about artist solutions as well, but it just tends to be front and center in video games. So did, that, it, did that come up through a specific argument that somebody had on one of your games? No, I, it's just, we've all noticed it. And our, again, because our team programmers have been around for so long, it's just this kind of this, like, you know, if you add a penny a day, it starts off not weighing at all. But by the time you're like five years in, that penny a day weighs like five pounds and you're carrying it around at all times. Yeah. Um, we still do it. We still like, I, we catch ourselves saying that all the time to everyone, but it's just, to me, that's part of the con part of the, like how words matter a lot to certain people or certain roles. Um, it's a great example. Are, it, are there other phrases that you guys have found are toxic that you don't even realize you're using? Oh, we're finding them all like all the time. But to me, like the, the, the let's just, or can we just is like the perfect metaphor to all of them. Yeah, They're like I not like people forgetting 
despite having worked in the industry for 10, 12 years, people forgetting that the process is not ever simple, yep. that every little thing that we do, and it's, I, I came, I have a, I used to work in film and TV. I went to film school actually with some of my co-founders and some of my employees. Um, and having that perspective, like, can you just, is actually a thing that, that is feasible, right? Like, can you, we used to just, it's always like changing lights. Can you just move the light a little bit to the left? Can you just move it? Like those were the, that was the dialogue that we had when we were making really crappy student movies. Um, but it doesn't work in video games whatsoever. And that's, I find, I get frustrated quite often when the film comparisons come to video games because I'm like, it's not, I'm not saying one is easier than the other, but one is, requires kind of two different styles of language almost for the technical side and the art side. Absolutely. Um, and film just never had to deal with that. Yeah. They do now when they're CGing huge portions of films, I think, but I don't think that they even need to change the dialogue that much because it's just artists talking to artists. Right. Did, well, speaking of your background in film, did you think that you would be embarking in a, on a career in games at when you were younger? Well, it's, a, it's weird. I mean, I don't want to sound like an asshole, but kind of, yeah. I mean, I went to... Well, why, would, why would that make you sound like an asshole? Well, because I, I feel like I, I know exactly... Like, I, I, I look back and my cousin, who's a programmer, but in, in educational software, and I used to sit down and just draw and grid paper and make our own games all the time as kids. And growing up, as I started to, like, take... Like, I, I did a lot of art growing up, and I was mm. really into drawing and painting and eventually digital... Um, and I, I always kind of thought like, I, I loved games. I got really into them very early. My dad, even though we were not the wealthiest of family, my dad put money aside and bought us a Commodore 64. And we, that's when I started playing games. Uh, and I still remember I, I played another world, um, and being like, oh, okay, these aren't just toys, right? Like, and I'm, God, I can't even remember how old I was. I got to tell Eric Chahi that to his face. And it was pretty, that was one of my career highlights was being like, hey, Eric, uh, you're a super nice guy. And also, like, I remember when the light bulb went off in my head wow. uh, and it was your game. Um, but yeah, I, I went to film school because, like, there was no video game schools at the time. Um, while you were there, were you thinking about making games and applying? No, to so that's, okay. that's, well, th it, it was a strange, it was a very strange thing. I got there and got really into video editing and post-production and then our school wasn't really that into it. So I took, I was a dumb kid and I took like all my college fund and bought a Mac G4 tower and a mini DV camera and just, and pirated some software uh, and taught myself how to use all of that stuff because I was really, really, I got really into, I was really into kind of digital art. And then once I figured out that you could use Final Cut and After Effects to like that, the extent that you could, I got really deep into that. And I thought that was what my career path was going to be. But while I was in film school at Ryerson, I lived in residence with uh, Tony Chan, who was one of the co-founders of the studio. Um, and he went off and was doing like crazy new media kind of like, going to school for making installation art. It was super strange. Sure. But we would always play video games in his room. Um, and what, then, what were you playing at the time? Uh, Ocarina of Time. Okay. Uh, yeah, we we were allowed to smoke in our dorm rooms at the time. Um, and I was a dumb kid. And Tony was like the one guy who was like cool with people smoking in his room because <laughs> he actually still smokes. You should quit, Tony. Um, but we used to just go into his room after we would go out drinking and just smoke cigarettes and play Ocarina of Time together. Um that was that was foundational stuff. Cool. And the second year was when I got lumped into a class uh, with uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Macromedia Director. Absolutely, I uh, remember I remember being enamored with it and saying, "Wow, th this new media stuff is awesome." Yeah, and it was in you programmed in lingo, which yep. was like their attempt to make programming into talking. Yeah. So it's like. So it was like uh, embarrassingly bad in a lot of ways. And but it, but it was the only software that was doing what it was. Oh doing. no! It, it, like. I found the process of learning it really interesting. Yeah. But then I would like read what I had done back and it just sounded like I was like writing a really bad story uh, with a lot of numbers in it. But yeah, we, we were supposed to make a portfolio website and me and this one other guy, this random dude who I had never really met, we both asked, asked the teacher separately if we could make a game instead of making okay. a portfolio. And the teachers were like cool, yeah, you guys can do whatever. So we ended up making a game together, and that's how Chris and I, Chris is our creative director, 
Uh, that's how we kind of got to we actually like got to be friends by making a, a bomb diffusing kind of like color matching game uh, yeah. that really didn't work very well. Um, but yeah, that that was kind of that was the spark. From then on, me and Chris and Tony knew that we kind of wanted to do something. But I ended up getting a like starting a good career in in video post production. I was editing a lot of crappy Canadian television. Uh, I got to edit one cool show. I was really into skateboarding, still love skateboarding. And I got to edit a skate one season of a skateboarding show okay. that then never got picked up. But, uh, but yeah, and then at the, at the, we finished university. We all started getting our jobs kind of under our belts. None of us really liked it at all. So we just rented a car, the three of us, and just packed up and drove from Toronto to San Jose to go to GDC. On f Technically, we were not students. We just... Uh, we scammed our way in as students so that we could get the $25 passes or whatever, and then just went up and talked to as many people as we can. And I'm still friends with like a few of the people who I met at that, at that GDC specifically, like people who were also trying to get into the industry at the time, uh, including uh, my super good friend, Dan Bunting, who yeah. now runs Triarch or is the senior multiplayer director of the last call of duty that triarch did anyways it's it's really interesting to kind of like look at that path and see where everybody is has gone um so yeah we went to gdc we met a whole bunch of people we were like okay this industry is way cooler than anything we're doing let's how do we get into it and that kind of started the ball rolling and there was a lot of people in toronto who were thinking the same thing but there were no studios there so we met up at the igda a chapter started a, f a thread started in the Toronto IGDA forum, and that thread was the foundation of our studio. We started meeting once a week. There was like 35 people the first week, and then the next week there was 32, and the next week until we had a group of 12. And that group of 12 worked together, give or take, for a year and a half or so on old smart, old, old pre smartphone cell phone games. Okay. So, like, yeah. couldn't push two buttons at once, monochrome. Six, the games were 64K. Wow. Um, and over that two years, a lot of the 12 dropped down and there was about nine of us who started the studio together. So we actually like went to a GDC, managed to find an agent who was leaving a big agency and starting his own agency. Uh, his name is Brad from Flashman. So he signed us before we even had a studio or anything and helped us get in front of some, some publishers. And so we signed a deal with Disney to, to make a cell phone game for the movie Cars before we even had an office. And that was that first check was what essentially started the studio. That was like August of 2005. Nice. And then we did license games for a really long time, and it was the worst. And we probably, had we not, uh, had the whole kind of like independent games movement not happened and had... Uh, Marin Reagan from Mennonet who made N and N plus and N plus plus had they not been our friends we would have shut the studio down because work for hire mobile games was not a fun life to live but it taught us a lot none of us had ever really made games before so yeah. we were getting paid to learn in kind of six to eight month increments with the most tight restrictions of possible as possible which is pretty much the best way to learn in a right. lot of ways so yeah it was a it was a it makes no the whole process doesn't make a lot of sense to me like how going to film school and then you know smoking in a room with someone and make like doing the wrong project in a portfolio class with someone else could lead to like now chris and tony and i have been working together for like almost 20 years now um but it's kind of i feel like that's again like it's the same thing as ideas like how do you find those perfect kind of like teams you don't really know what you're doing you're just taking a stab in the dark and a lot of times those relationships those like you know perfect pairings or perfect groupings of people come through those like moments that you're not, you have no control over whatsoever. Well, but still, it sounds to me that at the same time you were surrounding yourself with people who were part of the indie, the, the burgeoning indie scene. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a really great support group for what is a pretty risky venture. Oh yeah. It was even, I mean, I don't want to be the guy who's like, I used to have to walk uphill both ways in snow, but it was even riskier back then because you couldn't get on platforms at yeah. all, right? Yeah. Like we had, Microsoft would not let us release on their platform. Nintendo would not let us, like the only reason we even got a game on console was because of one person, like one person at Sony believed in us. Uh, so thank you, Nate, if you're listening. Uh, he's like you can, I can like track it back in a yeah. lot of ways. And that was kind of in 2007 or something like that when, when XBLA and PSN were just kind of coming up. Yeah. But, 
I still remember when when uh, I had played a ton of N. I was a, f- a Flash platformer that was super super popular. Free, you could just it was mm-hmm. just such an, such an utterly phenomenal game, and I couldn't believe that it was done in Flash at the time. And then they did N Plus for Xbox Live, and a lot of people credit Braid and kind of Castle Crashers those as like foundational games for, but. N plus came before them and it was selling like crazy. It was sold hundreds of thousands of copies. And it was just this couple from Toronto that we had been friends with who there, whose freeware game I was addicted to in university. Like it made no sense to me, but when we started looking at it, we're like, Oh, like, okay. Consoles are now letting these smaller games. They need to find a different market. They need to provide different types of games at a lower price point. Like they need to kind of fill a niche and, downloading games is going to be a big thing and you know it, it, everybody saw that writing so it was a per, the timing was perfect for us and we just that was right about when i started running the studio i was an artist at the studio before that um and uh, tom who was the president of the studio at the time he was really interested in iphone and, and he was a programmer as well so he left to start his own iphone studio okay um and that's it was like 2008 when when i took over i'm air quotes running the studio that's the wrong way to put it because i really don't run the studio but like as president of the studio um and yeah it it was it, the timing was pretty ripe so we got to get we were relatively early on psn for self-publishing um and that kind of helped us at the same time with, we put out a Might and Magic Clash of Heroes on DS. There was a lot of companies that were really, really interested in DS development. And because we had mobile background, it we could kind of cheat our way in and saying like, oh, like DS and mobile aren't that far apart. Like we can make pixels and all you can do on DS is pixel art really other than really, really great low poly stuff. But we, we could convince people that we could do it. And Ubisoft took a big chance on us on that one and ended up paying off pretty big for for them. (laughs) And then, uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of this like crazy, like, yeah, I I don't I don't take any credit for the fact that the timing is right. But I I do think that we did a really good job of just saying, like, okay, work for hire is all done. We've learned what we can learn from it. Either we're going to go broke and and blow up uh, or we're going to continue doing work for hire and blow up. So we might as well blow up the better way. We might as well do what we did to start, like what we set out to do in the very beginning. And it gave us a chance to try some ideas that we had floating around to like, I don't know, to actually like do what we set out to do. And then it's really, uh, it. one of the things that I, I, I think about a lot is like how the dumber, the stuff that appears dumb, the stuff that appears risky, the stuff that appears more failure prone is usually the more successful, more financially stable stuff. That's my whole history in games, albeit only my whole history in games is only Cappy. But my whole history is all the stuff that we do that that have that seems to from the outside have less of a shot is the stuff that that does the best for us. Yeah. So like all of our whatever success we have, um, it it's entirely built off of us taking risks and and doing things that seem like they are bad ideas from a purely business perspective. Well, you know, when I saw below a few years ago, right? I Many I looked at ago. that game. <laughs> I looked at that game. And I thought that's that looks like a really cool game. So when you come come up with and present a a concept like below, it doesn't seem like a dumb idea from a player's perspective because no. you're you're tapping into this, I think, desire from players who want stylized, independent feeling games that are taking some creative risks mm-hmm. and are doing something different than their the giant games that are selling for sixty dollars. Oh, absolutely. So, when you were concepting below, what was were you in? What, what were your what was your thought process? Well, it was pretty, it was actually really straightforward in the sense that uh, so. Most of our games have started as as ideas in in Chris Piotrowski's head, and then they get pitched to us in some way, shape, or form. Um, in the case of Below, I mean, this got he pitched this in two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, wow. super early. Um, he was really into like hardcore traditional roguelikes. Yeah. Um, and I totally didn't get. I'd never played them. I was never interested in that style of game. It just wasn't my cup of tea. 
Um, and so he pitched it and we kind of like hummed and hawed about it. And then he pitched it again and we kind of hummed and hawed about it. Um, and then he kind of gave, gave us like a, a, like a reading list except for games. And we just kind of went through and a bunch of us just tried some of the, like what would now be kind of considered rogue lights, mm -hmm. like not the super hardcores, but the ones that kind of have less rough edges that have, are a little bit less punishing, but are still super punishing. Um, and even though I wasn't super into it, I, I could see where he was coming from. And then that was kind of around when Demon Souls was mm -hmm. becoming a thing. Um, and so we could kind of start seeing like, oh, okay, like there is the, the, the kind of core ideas in the game. And what he pitched is literally what the game is now okay. from the like high level perspective. He really wanted to, like, you have to imagine that 1080p was not even a thing when he pitched this. Yeah. So he's saying, okay, 1080p is coming. We're going to have t like thousands of pixels. Everybody is doing kind of like over the shoulder, first person, get really close. Why don't we use the pixels to like the, the number of pixels to create a sense of scale? Why don't we pull the camera out? Why don't we make you super duper tiny because the resolution finally allows something like that? And then why don't we add tilt shift to it, like make it super stylized, but also to make super clear where you are. And then why don't we make all of the levels single screen? We got rid of all the all part, but the majority of below is single screen levels. And okay. we, I haven't played, I mean, I'm not trying to toot our own horn, but I haven't played a game with single screen levels right. for a really long time. Um, and especially with this very small character. Yes, especially it's, with It's somewhat counterintuitive. It is. And it, and it was just an utter pain in the ass to figure out how to make it all work. But those ideas are what he pitched. He wanted to make an accessible game inspired mm -hmm. by roguelikes with these kind of feature sets and after we kind of maybe i've got i can't even feel bad because i can't even imagine how many times he tried to convince us but at a certain point we were like okay first of all like he really cares about this uh but second of all i can see where this is going like yeah. it's weird it's different it kind of seems like like it seems like a bad idea in a lot of ways because it's, you know, it's super hard. I knew we well, all you, knew it was going to be super hard. But you, but one thing you just said was accessible. And that's, I mean, that's unique to describe a roguelike mm -hmm. as accessible. Was was that part of his ongoing log line to you guys? From the very first, like, third sentence that came out of his mouth. Okay. Um, because there are so many parts of traditional roguelikes that are, like, it's an impenetrable wall for most players. Right. Um and the players who get past that wall adore the genre with a passion. But a lot of us, myself included, just bumped up against that wall a couple of times and said, yeah, I'm going to go back and play Street Fighter. Um, and, and that's, that's the, like, Chris was always, and in the time that he was pitching it and in the time that it's been developed, like, people have had the same ideas and people have moved that wall further mm -hmm. and further or made that wall much more transparent. Yeah. And as a result, we have a lot of games that are, inspired by roguelikes that are hard but not s silly um like at a punishment level but yeah i mean all, like he the, the process was very straightforward the the tougher part was like we had to finish games before we could start prototyping and then we only we had i mean we prototyped a lot of the game uh in just a kind of two people, Kenneth, who was, who's a, our tech director and Chris and Tony, one of our artists. Um, they just kind of prototyped the whole thing, like just the entire kind of like random generation and was it in perspective. Unity or no, no, it was it engine. was in our it was I can't even remember what it was done in. Um, Kenneth, our tech director, just kind of has. Well, the, the reason I ask is because that, uh, in terms of the look and the the world, it's a big departure from the other games you've been oh, making. Oh, absolutely. It, we started out, it started out as a game in pixel art. Uh, it did the prototype. Oh, okay. And then when we moved it into our engine, we started doing like high res 2D. And then we started wanting to light it and we started wanting to cast shadows and we started wanting to, I mean, even something as simple as like, it, it felt kind of crummy uh, with eight directions. So then we wanted to do 16 directions. We want to do 16 directions with unique weapons and unique armor and all this kind of stuff. And all the artists were just looking at us like, you're, you're going to kill us. Like, this is going to be the worst thing in our lives. So took a step and did just, just the main character in 3D. And then we started punishing okay. more and more. And now, I mean, a huge portion of the game went from purely 2D to, I, I would say, like three quarters of the game or more. Everything except the backgrounds is 3D and the backgrounds are still hand-painted 2D. 
Um, was but, that was that challenging creating those features in your engine while you were trying to put the game together? Absolutely. Uh, that's. I mean, there's been a lot of really big lessons on how to how we work as developers but also just things that like in hindsight like when we started unity wasn't on console when we started it was still ue3 and there was a lot of challenges being an independent studio even trying to use unreal at that time right. um, so we had not a lot of choice but does we actually like took sony's fire engine which is kind of just used the rendering part of fire and the the fire team is actually great we did critter crunch and clash of heroes in it as well and then just built everything else around it um and that, that's it. I mean, rolling your own engine is not, it's, it's not fun for anybody except the people who are super into rolling your own engine. But yeah. I mean, it, in high, again, it's all hindsight. In hindsight, it, you know, there are a lot of different ways we could have approached it. And there are some, definitely some challenges, but there's also some huge strengths to it as well. And I think it's because it's also like, to me, one of the most important pieces of like making games being fun is, is the challenge and the learning and the doing something different than you've done before and mm -hmm. pushing yourself as a creator or as a programmer or as an artist. Um, and this, that this game pushed us, I mean, it's still pushing us as hard as we possibly can get pushed. So, I mean, it was a very, uh, going from like a prototype in SEL, that's what, that's what it's, it's like Kenneth, our tech director used to do all kinds of prototypes in just his own little like SDL pro toolbox. Um, going from that prototype to what we have now, like the game is just, like the game never would have been a, about the things that it's even about had we not decided on the different kind of technical and creative choices that we made. Like even just something like as silly uh, and, and, and to certain people, the idea of like adding lighting into a game might be like, well, all games have lighting, but a lot of 2D games just fake mm -hmm. lighting and that, and it looks phenomenal and that we've done it a million times and we'll, we're doing it right now on our game with Cartoon Network. But the flip side is that like if you actually want to make light part of the game you can't fake it anymore and even just that process has been i mean the game is about something almost entirely different because we were able to do really cool things with real-time lighting and shadows and that even just that has pushed the game in a totally different direction and made it about something that it wasn't about in chris's original pitch do you see that helping you with future pitches internally just i mean i know you're working on the cartoon network game which is uh, a different approach. Oh, absolutely. But when you when you look ahead, now that you've got the capability of doing real-time lighting with 3D objects in your engine, is that something you think about for uh, enhancing even further as you... I'm thinking a lot about not doing our own engine at all anymore. Oh, okay. Um, and, I, and I think all of our programmers are very excited about, we don't really have anybody who are engine nerds at the studio, oh. so to speak. I mean, Brian, who's another one of our, our, our most senior and lead technical people who's done kind of the most work on the engine for Below, I think even he's excited to maybe like get back into certain parts of game development that are not just engine sure. focused. I mean, it absolutely um, makes sense where you can, you can focus more attention on design, on gameplay programming, on... Yep. I think what the, the biggest thing for me is like whether we take that engine and move it further or whether we switch to Unreal. I mean, we're uh, OKKO is in Unity. We've had a lot of really great results in Unity for our 2D stuff. Like no matter where it ends up going, the the there are certain pieces of below that will really drive our like foundational knowledge for wherever we go and yeah. the ways that, I mean, even something like below has a, a huge component of it is just like nav meshes and, and how enemies and the player is restricted in space because while we're procedurally generating all of the levels, we need to know a whole ton of information. And Brian spent a whole bunch of time working with, uh, the people who were like, we did three or four different full iterations on the procedural generation. Um, but just spending a whole bunch of time figuring out how to like deal with nav mesh is like in 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 our two D stuff. It, it ne was never really that important to right. us, and it's not just an ex explicitly three D kind of concept. But it's something that like oh, we just learned we had to learn how to do that. We had to learn how to you know render lighting well and yeah. on consoles and all all of those learnings they they inform wherever you go they're kind of not unique to an engine and i think it's going to be really interesting to see i mean i really don't know where we'll end up i have no idea what tech we will use because it's always been driven by 
the the creative side and for better or for worse that's because all of the founders of studio are creative people like there are we don't have any technical people kind of the founders of the studio so the creative side tends to drive the choices that our, our amazing technical team make in a lot of cases so yeah it's it's gonna i mean even if you look at it right now i mean okko is is essentially us trying to make a like a cartoon video game like a, a saturday morning cartoon video game uh, like it's meant to be a card a playable cartoon at the same time we're making like a super isolation isolated dark um moody 3d light and dark adventure roguelike inspired like they're, they're really re like they're as far apart as they can possibly i think be. that's fantastic i mean being able to jump back and forth between the two and having both exist at the same time within the studio and we've experienced that here at insomniac where whether it's ratchet and resistance yep. or that's, that's, i use that example all the time like yeah. I, I think that's a very to me uh there's like there, there's two two styles of two styles of studios that I think have done really well in video games. It's the people who figure out what they're great at and just dive so deep into that thing and become masters of it. Or there's people that can kind of bounce around a little bit and try different stuff. And I, yeah, I always use the the ratchet resistance because it's they couldn't be farther apart. Well, thanks for saying that. I, there are, however, the themes that run through everything I think studios uh, like Copy and Insomniac do. And one of the ones uh, that I've noticed with your games is humor. Yeah. And I, we at Insomniac, we filled a lot of questions about humor because our games, for the most part, are, tend to have some humor in them, even if it's sometimes unintentional. Mm -hmm. So has that been an explicit uh, requirement? I mean, maybe outside of Below? That oh, Below is the first game that we've ever done that hasn't been about us like trying to be funny in some way so I mean, even even sorcery was meant to be like there's a lot of tongue-in-cheek in that oh game. totally i mean that that absolutely comes through and that was one of the reasons i loved it so much was because it was sarcastic and uh sort of yeah it had a lot of what felt like very inside ish and that's humor. that's why i mean that game worked because super brothers who did all the art and led the design with chris and who wrote every word in that that's why we got along that's i mean mm. we made that game together and i think it worked so well was because we kind of understood that like this game can simultaneous simul, uh, simultaneously be serious like purposefully p pretentious and funny right and all of those things can intermingle and it's the same like time force uh was us kind of like unshackling the humor in a lot of ways um and just saying like what like let's put the studio sense of humor. Let's not like try to like make uh, uh, make jokes that fit the game. Let's make a game that fits our jokes in a lot of ways. And that a lot of that game is references to movies that we think are funny. And right. um, like film in general has a really important like background as I was talking about. And another one of our co-founders of the studio, there's four of us who all went to film school, four of the five oh, co-founders all were at different film schools. But yeah, it's humor is definitely like pretty central. I, 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 how do your I, how do your fans respond? Um, I think most people really don't like humor in games, or they say they don't like humor in games. Mm. They they every one of our games. Uh, I'm again super biased because there are games, but I, I I think we do comedy writing really well. I think our games are actually funny. Yeah. I think they're they have a an angle to them that's that's good and like objectively well done well it's authentic um, i mean that's yeah. what i feel like when i play your games is that it's not you're not trying to be funny no because you can try to be funny and totally miss it yeah. becomes campy or corny and yeah. it just doesn't shine through as somebody uh, as as it, it doesn't shine through as much as it when a team is just naturally yeah. funny they but have the gift i i feel like in video games it is exponentially harder to hit with humor than it is to hit with with drama or melodrama absolutely i think we're an industry built on melodrama and we quite often aren't willing to like reflect on the fact that a lot of our drama becomes melodrama and that the melodrama becomes humor yeah um and and, and we've trained players to actually even like consume that in a way that isn't as humor which i think is i don't think it's bad i just don't think that it 
it helps people who are actually trying to write humorous games. I think it makes the humor harder to like, is this just melodrama? Like, are they saying this tongue in cheek or are they saying it seriously? Um, yeah, I think humor is really hard. And we, I, I, I think we've taken a lot of shit for it uh, in a lot of ways. Like, I think a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people don't like the stuff that we've written. Hmm. Uh but they're the vocal ones. Okay. I think like 99% of people, I mean, for the most part, the my favorite part of the response of Super Time Force was the people who got all the way to the ending, watched the ending cutscene, and then were like, that's actually funny. Like it's actually, <laughs> it's quite, we, it got speed run at, at AGDQ like two years ago or so. And the speedrunner was like, okay, and now we're just going to stop and watch this the final cutscene because most of you probably haven't seen it. And they're like the, the crowd was laughing. And I think it's, I don't know, I um, can't get over the bias, but I'm like, I, I think it's actually funny. But I do think that it's really hard to hit with that in video yeah. games. I think it's getting better. I think there are, over time, um, more people who, like more comedy writers, people who are more interested in writing comedy yeah. or people who acknowledge the melodrama and, and play it the right way. Um, I also think just in general, writing in games is getting just substantially better, yeah. um, especially in the last few years. Um, so that also helps. The, the, the separation between drama or dramatic writing and and humor, if the further that separation is, the less they kind of blend into each other, the, the easier it is for us to write funny games that are going to be taken as funny games. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I think I think it's really refreshing to have studios that aren't afraid to try that because it is it's not safe necessarily, but it's the it's the less stressful route sometimes to take the more dramatic. Absolutely. Uh, and yep. Absolutely. and it's and, and go that and not and not take a risk that your humor may fall flat with some of the fans out there. So kudos to you. No, thanks. I mean, it's, a lot it. of that is Dan and Chris and Matt and the, the people who do the most. I've, thankfully, I'm, I don't, I don't like, I am not, I don't portray myself or, or ever see myself as being any role other than what I'm doing. But I think the one that's at the bottom of my list is writing. Like I just, <laughs> like it's so far away from what I think I can do. So I have a huge amount of respect for people who are good at it and who actually like, it's a, it's really putting yourself out there. I mean, making games is a lot of putting yourself out there, but being a writer, the writer of a game, especially ones that have a lot of dialogue, or oh, yeah. it's your. Well, I think it's people o overlook that really easily because we tend to focus on, I think, in the industry, designers, uh, programmers, artists, yep. audio engineers, the people who have more traditionally been sort of occupying those pillar roles in studios and writers coming into the studio are a relatively new thing. I know yeah. here at Insomniac, it was, we all participated in the writing yeah. versus thinking about, well, maybe we should bring in a writer from the outside to help us write. And and it's it's been really great, as you're pointing out, to see more and more talented writers coming into the industry from outside mm -hmm. because they help us all elevate our craft. For sure. They're, I think as independent studios, especially small independent studios, you constantly try to take on more than you can handle. Right. And a lot of it is like you just a lot of it is circumstance. A lot of it is you have to. Um, but as time goes on, letting go of that is hard. And I think for a lot of things, whether it's art or design or and writing gets it all the time where people just want to contribute to it because yeah. they want they have ideas. They want to get those ideas out there. And that's that's. That's why we do this, but but yeah. to your point, I mean, I think you, you said this about humor before. It's 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 hard, it's hard. and it's, it's it is hard. a craft. And when writers have been have a lot of experience and have been trained, and uh, sometimes are coming from the outside, the difference in say me writing something and somebody who's a professional writer writing something is just is night and day. Yeah, it's it's completely, and that's yeah. With the so when uh, when we started talking to Cartoon Network and started meeting up with Ian Jones Cordy, who's the creator of OKKO OK and who was like co-executive producer of Steven Universe and was a director and animator uh, or board artist on Adventure Time. When we started sitting down with him and, and Toby Jones, who's his kind of like, they're, they're the tag team in charge of OKKO. OK One of the things that, that we were talking about a lot was like, okay, we're going to write our own, like this is going to be Cappy writing it. And Dan Vader, who's the the game director on it and who's the writer on it, was just kind of sitting around and spitballing. And the show was being built 
uh, was being written, we were kind of literally like cued into everything. We would see all the outlines, we'd see all the edits, we would see. Um, and so when Dan started writing our game, he was tied into and working alongside TV writers. And at a certain point when the script was getting closer, we'd come to Burbank, actually just like right up the street, um, and just sit in the writer's room and talk about. And it was really interesting because I was, I remember thinking to myself like, oh, Dan obviously has to go and like hang out with the writers from the show because he's writing, because he's also writing the show. Yeah. But I realized like pretty quickly that I was talking about the game that we were making as a show all like just normally. Um, and I think that was part of the reason why that I love the script in it. The voice actors had a, like we got it's all the voice actors from the TV show. Oh, cool. They're all phenomenal, but they they treated it as an episode of the show, and right. then, as a result, it kind of built this like vibe around the game, kind of almost led by the writing that we were making a cartoon video, like a a playable cartoon, a playable a, like series of episodes of a cartoon, and that like it's. To me, it's super interesting to have, you know, the the voice, the, the written voice be the thing that's kind of driving a lot of the creative. And that came from Ian and Toby and Dan working together to kind of figure out, like, what what is the game about? Where can it deviate? What characters? Because there's, like, a million characters in the TV show. Like, we know who we're going to focus on. We know it's about KO. We know it's about his mom and his friends at the bodega and that kind of stuff. But, like, what of the cast of characters are we going to write? Who's going to be in the first season of the show? who's not in the show at all that we can add to the game and, and build little mini episodes around them. And that's, I mean, gosh, it's, there's so much dialogue in that game because it's writing episodes essentially. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've never really had a game that was so driven by a script. Mm -hmm. um, and even though there's gameplay that is completely removed from the script uh, in terms of like, you know, we're not telling you exactly why you're fighting these robots that you're fighting. But you really know exactly why, because the script has kind of led you to that point. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I, I could not do it at all. I actually have, like, I'm, like, sending Dan, like, emails that I'm writing to people being, like, can you, like, make this sound less dumb? Yeah. Like, uh, cause that it's, sounds like the kind of bugs I write. Because you don't, it's hard to come up with solutions. It's much better to see if you can even identify the problem. Because yeah. that's And that's hard, especially when it comes to writing or story. Right? You know something's off or not connecting, but it's really sometimes hard to get specific. But that's why we have talented people on our teams who yep. can figure those things out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really. I mean, we're very lucky that we have people who can write. Yeah. I think that's that's been super. I mean, even with Below, I mean, Below has actually zero dialogue. Hmm. There is no. The only words in the entire game are in the menus. That's it. There's no. But there is story. Like yeah. there's there's a, a very big piece of lore behind the game, and that was. You know, Chris writing that and putting that all together and then over the years kind of like changing it and maneuvering it into what the game actually became about over time. And yeah, it's been all of that kind of like foundational writing stuff is is super important even for games that don't even have that, that aren't about the script, that aren't driven by a script, that don't have cutscenes even necessarily. So so I want to go back to the something you mentioned a few minutes ago when you were talking about independence. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about being independent mm -hmm. and you mentioned it. And because you are heavily connected to the indie scene mm -hmm. up in Toronto and I think just across the entire industry. It'd be great for you to share your view of where we are now with indie scene, what that means to you, mm -hmm. and what how you think it's going to evolve over the next, say, five years. Well, I mean, I think there's it's the like most exciting, scariest time. Like it's the 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 balance of of the two. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the whole indie apocalypse and and when did it, that start? Because I can't remember it's like seeing a, that at, in a in a series of articles. I just remember seeing it every now and then. That word. yeah, I think it's been going on for like a year and a half now or so. There were some talks about it at GDC last year. Um, I, I think really what it represents is people realizing that like game development is has kind of hit that like first tier of democratization, and so way more people are making stuff. The pl people are also re realizing that the platforms don't necessarily have to support all of us all at once mm -hmm. um that even though you know sony made a big push for independent development in the beginning of the ps4 some people are kind of realizing that like that big push like there's no obligation for that big push to be permanent and i'm not saying that sony isn't doing a lot for independent developers i'm just saying it was at the time of the launch of the ps4 it was a it was a tentpole and 
even over time, that tempo is going to become different. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with Steam. Like there, there was a time where getting a game on Steam, you had a you know one in five chance of actually selling some pretty okay numbers. And you know, there's more games launched in the last month than there was in like five years of Steam combined. Like there's, it's a very different market. And yeah. I think that's that's really what this whole kind of like, if I was to simplify my opinion on on the indie space and or the the business of the indie space, is that like. The markets have changed drastically, and independent studios have to acknowledge that. They have to change the way that they uh, think that their games are going to get out there, and then the way that they actually get them out there. Promotion and marketing is so much has always been important, but now more than ever. Like, and what what specific advice then do you have for other indies who may not have twenty five people in their studio or the backing of a publisher to to get out there and and survive. Yeah, I mean, I, all of my advice uh, is like massive grain of salt because I'm living a, a very different version of of like my experience as a, a kind of the like business head of a independent studio is so fundamentally different than what a six person studio making their first game. Um, to me, it, it even drills down even deeper than that. In that, like the genre of game that you're doing has such a dramatic impact on the direction that you take for achieving success mm -hmm. or even how you take steps towards success. Like my, let's say, uh, you can, if you are making, uh, an RTS and ask me about what I did on steam for super time force, it's already a failed question because the genre is so different. The game came out about three years ago, uh, you know, we had a different financial situation. We had already had a relationship with a, with people at Valve and we could show them the game and get feedback. Or, like all of those things eliminate the relevance of my opinion in a lot of ways. But um, you, as an, you as somebody who has been living in the indie world and surrounded by other yeah. indie developers can still answer that question. Oh, I totally can. It's just that I, I, I'm always super weary about uh, the way that I give advice because yeah. I do think that we're kind of at that time now where I, I think the macro is way like my macro opinion uh is so tainted uh for better or for worse by the last 12 years of my experience um but overall i, I do think that like uh i think still years later video is of the utmost importance like being able to show your game in a cool trailer or a cool gameplay video or awesome gifts on twitter or showing like a beautiful understandable version of your game to players uh is an exceptional way like that's the kind of like the the bare minimum mm -hmm. that you have to do um and it doesn't even matter if you have a website anymore yeah. right people are going to go to youtube and search it people are going to go to twitch and see if people are playing it people like they want th the way that people are searching for games has fundamentally changed even so if you have rad video or if you're s letting streamers play early versions or something like having the game uh, look awesome, be like grab attention very quickly and, and, uh, be clear what the game actually is about in video is like just super important. I think that for me, that's like, so when I, I, I do work with indie fund, um, and so we kind of fund, uh, independent games kind of in the like lower range of budgets, um, say from like $20,000 to like $200,000. And, uh, a lot of the games that I've or Cappy has invested in as part of Indie Fund have been games that have sent uh, really rad video to grab the attention and a, and a good prototype or demo so we could see where the game was actually going. Um, and I think it's kind of the same way that you get attention for, for money is the same way you get attention for players. Is like, do I understand it? Does it look rad as hell? Do I want to talk about it? Does it have a hook that I, that I can feel or see or talk about? Um, and then it, it, the other side of it is like, being very aware of the quality bar that is minimum for success these days, um, I think is another thing. Like I, we worked at, we did two years of Cappy while we were working full-time jobs. So I was editing video and then going home and making our first games because none of, like none of us wanted to risk being homeless or anything like that. Um, and I think there is a, a, a people watch any game, the movie or people read Twitter and they think like, Oh, I got this great game idea. I should dive right into it. I, th I, th I think that's a, a, a very bad recipe. I think that like 
there's such a thing as positive pressure and negative pressure. Positive pressure is like, people want me to succeed. I believe I can do this. Like I've got a real chance here. Negative pressure is like, I better not fuck up or I'm homeless. I better not screw up or like I, you know, this is my life. I quit my job and this is all I got. That's not going to, you're not going to make, I, I totally disagree with the whole, like you need to be suffering to be a great art. That's, that's not, that's, that's a lie. And maybe that in the past it was, but nowadays, like, you can work a nine to five and come down and, and learn how to develop games. Yeah. Um, it's because it's so hard to, to make a mark on your first title. It's is, so hard. Is that what most of the indie fund participants are doing? Working a uh, full-time job and then uh, no, when they can? A lot of this, the studios that we funded, our funding is what helped them go from working part-time on a game to working full-time on a game. Oh, that's great. Um, I mean, all the way back to like we did, we funded a game called Cube, uh, and it was uh, some awesome people who were coming out of university, and they were their paths were like we could either keep working on this cool game we were working at, uh, or we can go get a job and then just keep working on it in in our spare time. Like they were going to make the game either way, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why I, I I think those guys are awesome. But um, finding funding is the only safe way to kind of do that, right? If right. it's hard to find money, and if you can, then that's a then you removing that that negative pressure. You're not you're no longer saying to yourself like, if I don't do this, I'm screwed. Uh, now you're saying like, okay, I got the backing. Like these guys want me to succeed. Like I, I can see myself succeeding. You're putting pressure on yourself, but that pressure is is a positive one. Yeah. How, how many how many pitches do you guys look at every year? Um, for indie fund. A lot less now because there's a huge rise in smaller, medium-sized publishers for independent games in the past two years. I would say like half of what we usually oh. would see. Um, but I mean, it, it could totally depend. Some months we could see four or five pitch by pitches. I mean, like things that actually like do what we ask for on the website, as opposed to just like somebody emailing us a game idea. Right. Um, some months it might only be one or two. Some months it could be five or six. Um, we there's there's now like 20 people or so that are participating in indie fund it used to be just a group of of seven of us that kind of started it and we were like we acted as one group and then over time uh it did it was very successful and we did a lot of stuff that i'm super proud of but we all also run game studios at the same time or have you know jobs working at google or various other places so we decided that instead of asking more of us we could ask more people to take on pieces of it and so now it's a group of kind of individual individual independent developers who are investing kind of individually but as a group that sounds um, like a lot of fun it's it's i wish i had more time for it it's really really i mean it's been super super awesome and we've been able to i think do some good yeah I mean, the the terms are right up on the website for people to read. That like the contract is literally there for people to read. Um, the terms, the repayment, the the whole structure of it, I I think is really really. And I mean, I have to definitely credit Ron Carmel and Aaron Isaacson who kind of like were the did the brunt of the work for mm -hmm. the entire thing. In the past, gosh, it was it's probably like nine years now or eight years that we've been doing it. Um, but it's it, it does provide me a, a great opportunity to kind of see what's going on under the radar at first even stuff like some of our games have started out in indie fund and then found publishers kind of gone the, the different routes so i've been a huge fan of uh, ben esposito uh, he's making this game called donut county and it's about you are a whole swallowing things and as you swallow stuff the hole gets bigger and it's kind of a narrative puzzle toy um and i've i i mean ben's a phenomenal game creator he worked on unfinished swan and what remains to be the Finch kind of with, uh, with giant sparrow a bit. Um, but he's been making his own stuff, um, and has like a whole separate thing with arcane kids. That's their own like little, they, they did like the, the Bubsy 3d game. That's essentially like Bubsy going to a James Terrell exhibit. Uh, they, they made a whole ton of stuff, but Donut County, I, I, I love from the very beginning and it just took Ben a while to like between working part time in on other games and just kind of finding that game. It took him a while and, uh, over time, Indie Fund was less helpful for him, but Annapurna was like knew the game, loved the game, and so we were able to kind of be like, what Ben really needs is more resources and more support and some design feedback, all the stuff that we can't and don't do at Indie Fund. We're mostly money with some kind of like feedback, yeah. um, and so it was a great kind of shift there, right? Okay. It was it was a perfect fit, and it 
that's a, a kind of emblematic of where I think things have gone in the independent scene as well, because now there's the Devolvers and the Annapurnas and Raw Fury and 505 is doing a whole bunch of stuff. And like you could like that, I'm probably forgetting like Ford of Double Fine Presents and like there's so many smaller publishers that are like team 17 is doing a lot of publishing now like mode seven like there's I, there's so many people that are doing kind of publishing or publishing light or funding plus uh and a whole ton more people who are doing it under the radar just to help other teams out or to make good investments that's shifted things a lot because the the i mean even indie fund is not maybe not necessarily the best game in town for people looking for funding as independent developers which is really interesting because for a while we were like no one's going to beat this. Like these are the best terms. If you know, we're looking for the upper crust, but their terms are great. And now there's people who are providing marketing and platform support and QA and all these other things that we'd like, I got to make games. I can't do any of that. Uh, so it's, a, it's been a super interesting and very, it's very eye opening for me because I'm on both sides. I am fun helping to fund games, but I'm also getting my games funded and I'm trying to like look at how people's projects are going to succeed while trying to help my own projects succeed. And it gives you a lot of, it's a fun perspective to have. I would highly recommend people do it for themselves. Well, speak, speaking of that, since, I mean, I imagine that a lot of our listeners out there are, have just listened to what you said about all the opportunities for funding or having their idea at least vetted by a, a group like Indie, Indie Fund or others and are going, well, what do I really need to do? So, Given that some of these folks may exist, what would be your one piece of advice for that person who is passionate about getting into development, hasn't taken this that first step off the cliff yet, but really knows that this is his or her path? Unless you're the like 0.0001% who can do everything yourself, uh, the my number one piece of advice is like find cool people to who, who share that desire to make something. They don't have to be your best friends. Uh, they will probably end up being your best friends, but like they don't, they can be people you randomly meet on the internet. They can be people you go to school with. They can be friends that you grew up with. It doesn't matter. Games are, unless you're that 0.00001%, games are made by teams. Um, and the more people that are invested, the more motivation you get and the more likely you are to see that actually through. Um, I, I completely believe the only reason why Cappy went from a bunch of IGDA youngsters trying to make something actually and, and actually having made something was because there was a lot of us, because we had a bunch of people who were at least somewhat like minded, but who were who were like, oh, crap, like I actually have like a team of people and they've just given me de like tasks to do. like I have somebody telling me what I need to complete this week and then I, I don't want to let them down. Also, I want to make it look super awesome, so I'm going to put in that extra time, and I'm going to do this other thing. And what we found was, I mean, even though it takes way longer to do it part-time, because we had a team from the very beginning, essentially, it, it was the kind of snowball down a hill. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, the tools are there. The the tutorials and, and support and forums and all that are there. What you need is, is I think, uh, people to do it with. If you're, uh, like if you're a writer, an artist, a programmer, it's it's... I've seen a lot of really interesting prototypes made by programmers who don't have artists working on it, and those games will go nowhere. And I, I hate to be uh, like that harsh about it, but like if I play something that feels great, that's awesome, but that's really hard to do, and, and I will give you tons of credit for it. But if it doesn't have a look, a feel, a style visually and, and audio, and if the game is narrative writing, and then you're you've already lost the fight. So that's why those teams to me are so important. It's why getting together with people and why I, I like I can't when I when I hear about people who make games by themselves, I'm I, I'm I'm always like you're the like you're the people who get removed from the average. Like you're the you're the you're it's like when you talk about like, oh, the most successful independent games, you don't count Minecraft in there because it skews everything so much. It's yeah. the same about making games. Like you don't count the people who can do it by themselves because there's like four of them in the whole world. Um, <laughs> yeah. the whole, all the rest of us have to work with other people. And that's, I kind of feel bad for the people who do it by themselves because they're missing out on the best part of making games, which is like getting together with a whole bunch of weirdos and trying silly stuff and having fun doing it. That is fantastic advice. So I, I think that's a great, great statement to end on. If people want to contact you or have questions about things you said today or indie fund or anything at all, how should they get in touch with you? 
Um, well, IndieFund has an entire process for all of this. The indie-fund.com is the website. Just go there. Every, all the information you'll need from contract to contacts to you, all the process is all there. So that's one-stop shop. If you have questions specifically about IndieFund or about Cappy or about games or anything, I'm on Twitter at Cappy underscore Nathan. So C-A-P-Y underscore Nathan. And then if, you know, there's any other... Sp- if you're interested in just talking about video games in general, uh, there's a lot of us out there in the game development side who are always kind of happy to talk, um, preferably in person at events like PAX's Game Developers Conference. Um, that's how a lot of, well, that's how my team got our start was going to these things and talking to game developers and asking questions in person so we could see who these people actually are. And I will warn you, they're all cool. <laughs> That's great. Nathan, thank you so much. That was super duper fun, man. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.